I will rise again. There's no power on earth that will hold me down. I hope that your spirit has been lifted this morning already. It's a privilege for my brothers and I to greet you in the name of God the Father and Christ the Son and welcome you into this house of worship. 2,000 years ago, Jesus gathered with uh, the 12 men that he had called into the ministry. And he gathered them together in the upper room. And he gathered them there for the purpose of, of sharing the Passover meal with them. And when they had finished the meal of the Passover, then he introduced to them the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And so from, from that day forward, those two events are, are forever linked together, the, the Passover and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And we celebrate that this morning on this unique Sunday when the Passover ends this evening at sundown, and we celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and the, and the imagery of those two events uh, combined this morning for a powerful ministry in the in the Passover, there was a, the desire for God to, uh, to have his people remember their days in bondage in Egypt and how they would have stayed in bondage had God not intervened on their behalf. He asked them in, in the final kind of plea to, uh, to Pharaoh to, to release his people. Uh, you remember he, with the final plague, he asked uh, the people of Israel to to adorn the, the doorpost and the, and the lentil of their, of their homes with the blood of the sacrificial lamb. And if they would do that, the angel of death would pass over them. And they did that. And out of that act, they were released from bondage. And that image is bright in my mind this morning. And it combines with this imagery of the, of the table before us. This morning as we come together, um, we've come together with that specific purpose of sharing in the, in the bread and the wine. The bread that is a representation of the body of Christ and the wine which is a representation of his blood. And just as Jesus offered unto his disciples in that very special day, Come and do this in remembrance of me. He sends that invitation to you this morning as well. The imagery combines with that of the Passover, where Jesus is the sacrificial lamb that was offered. And this covenant relationship that we've made with him is, is, is really our opportunity to adorn the... Uh, the doorpost and the, and the lentil of our lives with the blood of Jesus. And so that all comes together today and this marvelous morning, this Resurrection Sunday. It all has meaning and it all has purpose and it all fits together perfectly because the tomb is empty. If Jesus had simply gone to the cross and died and remained dead forever, then, then none of our efforts here this morning would be of any value. But because that's what he did, all of it becomes clear and all of it makes sense. And this morning, we'll have the opportunity for each one of us to stretch forth our hand, remembering our covenant, stretch forth our hand and partake of the bread and the wine. It's a day of remembrance. It's a day of glory. I want to read from you the... the theme from the month that it comes as Jason shared a little earlier I'm going to read one verse up from where he started in uh, chapter 7 of the book of 2nd Nephi I'm going to start at verse 39 and now behold the Lord remembereth all those who have been broken off wherefore he remembereth us also I think that's important for us to remember this morning that not only are we come here to remember Jesus, but we need to recognize that he's remembered us in all that he's done. 
He did so because he remembered us. Therefore, cheer up your hearts and remember that you're free to act for yourselves, to choose the way of everlasting death or the way of everlasting life, of eternal life. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil and the flesh. And remember, after ye have reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that you are saved. Wherefore, may God raise you from death by the power of the resurrection and also the everlasting death by the power of the atonement, that ye may be received into the eternal kingdom of God, that ye may praise him through grace divine. Amen. And so our prayer this morning is that we remember him and recognize that he's remembered us. And may we glory in in the testimony of Jesus this morning and remember that uh, the tomb is empty and he did rise again. And shall we worship together in praise and thanksgiving. As I offer an invocation on this service this morning, I encourage all of you to pray also with me. Our God is so powerful. If he can come back from the dead, he can listen to all of our prayers together. Would you pray with me? Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I have so much excitement right now to be here in your house on this most special day. Lord, this is the day. You have made this day specially just for us. And we rejoice and we are glad in this day. Lord, we are so thankful that you have the power that death cannot stop you. Wow, if you think about that, death cannot stop you from doing your work. Lord, we thank you for your love that you have demonstrated. A love that is greater than a mother's love for her child. And Lord, as we ask a special blessing on this service that you might penetrate our hearts and that we might feel your love move through us maybe in a way that we've never felt before. Lord, I pray for our brother John as he has prepared the spoken word today. I pray that you might relax him, that you might give him a peace and a surety, that you love him. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. A reminder about our offerings, uh, for those of you who don't know, Um, There are a couple plates in the back. Uh, If you'd like to give offerings, you can do so on your way out. If you would pray with me. Our kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before Thee this bright, beautiful morning. And Lord, we know that nothing we do, nothing we give, nothing we have is worth the gift You give to us. Lord, I'd ask that You would bless us, that we might do all we can to be good stewards over that which you've given us, that we might give of our heart and of our mind and our body and of, of our actions for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your most holy name. And in the beauty of this day and in the beauty of thy holiness, we sit together as your children under the influence of that good spirit which we've all come to recognize uh, to various degrees in our own lives. And we come uh, this morning with a marvelous opportunity to draw closer unto you and to sense again that we are not alone in this world of ours and that there is some place, someone, 
to whom we can go and share of our heart's desires, of our concerns and of our pains and of our disappointments, and find in you a comfort. Father, we have each in our life's journey taken uh, many roads. Some have led to you and others in times past have led uh, away. And it is through our own choices that we have at times estranged ourselves from you. And yet those times, Father, we know do not define us. They do not reduce in any way your love for us. And we know, O Father, because of your son Jesus who came and showed us how to live life and who chose to go to the cross for us sinners that those sins that we have committed are forgiven and we no longer need to drag them as a ball and chain through our lives. We are free. And so this day, Father, as we remember your son, And that eternal sacrifice he made for each one of us. Help us, Father, to be able to reaffirm to you our commitment. Our covenant to follow you as best we can all the days of our lives. And would ask, O Father, that you would grant unto these your children the wisdom and the strength and the courage to do so and to face whatever they must, knowing that you are by their side, walking each day, each moment with them. And as they partake, Father, help them to realize that they are indeed our most worthy. Yes, our actions have not been but We are yet worthy in thy sight, and you've placed a spark of divinity within each one of us. And you love us beyond our ability to even understand. And we rejoice, Father, in your Son, who willingly came to earth, who suffered among men, who knew a kiss that didn't mean what a kiss ought to mean, and who found when the going got the toughest, all turned away and left him alone. And we realize too often in our lives we have turned away. And yet, that divine love is always ready to forgive and to embrace and to hold before each one of us a larger vision and view of that which you would have us to become if we choose to look up and to rejoice and to have that hope And that joy that you promise us each day. And so let us, Father, reaffirm to you this day our desire to be better followers of you. Help us to be more steadfast. And help us to be aware of the many ways that you have blessed us. And be aware of the ways in which you will nudge us along the path that you would have each one of us to go. 
for along that path are joys immeasurable along that path is a way that you've designed for each of us to walk wherein we will sense the power of that presence and that love of a son. How great thou art, Father. How wonderful is this Jesus. And we celebrate his life, his death, that resurrection power that comes to each of us as we ask. And so we rejoice, Father, in this Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen. Good morning. I know that our pastor Jason um, gives prayerful consideration to the worship themes that he provides for us to guide our ministry. Our annual theme is um, reminds us that um, our Heavenly Father is uh, constantly calling to us. through the ministry of the Spirit and many other sources. And he's calling us to make choices. He's calling us to uh, choose the ways that Jesus exemplified for us, to choose his ways, and to choose eternal life. And... The theme for April, I think, is especially fitting for today because it is to choose the way to eternal life. And that is the way that Jesus laid for us in these, these events that we celebrate today. I have a number of scriptures that I want to read, beginning with Matthew. In uh, chapter 20, verses 16 and 17. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he shall rise again. Again in Matthew 26, 17 and 18. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. They were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Mark 14, 38 through 40 in Gethsemane. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. John 18, 33 and 34. Then Pilate entered into the kingdom hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? And then in verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should 
bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? Mark 15, 14, and 15. And Pilate spake again and said unto them, What will ye then that I shall do with him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Deliver him unto us to be crucified. Away with him. Crucify him. Luke 23, 34, and 35. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And finally, from Luke 24, the first five verses. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher and two angels standing by it in shining garments. And they entered into the sepulcher and not finding the body of the Lord Jesus, they were much perplexed thereabout and were affrighted and bowed down their faces to the earth. But behold, the angel said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. So these verses I've read to you just now, these glimpses into the Easter story, um, really call to me. I find them to be powerful and compelling and deep. I just called it the Easter story, and I really shouldn't use that word because uh, story is uh, a word that's too human and too puny. Because the events of of 2,000 years ago, at at this time of year that we celebrate as Easter, those events were the climax of the most momentous, most significant period in the history of mankind. The time that Jesus was here on earth. And Easter was the climax. The climax of God's work. But his work's not done. You know, God, through Jesus, created men and women. And he created us to have agency. It's as though God said, let's give them the right to choose. Let's give them words of truth to guide them. Let's give them the gift to be able to choose life. And how did mankind choose? Crucify him. But God always knew. He knows all things. He always knew what would be required to bring us across the gulf of sin that separates us from him. To be able to come into his presence and to experience his love. The sacrifice of the only perfect man, the Son of God, an infinite atonement is required to satisfy the demands of justice for the infinite debt of my sin. It's already been mentioned today, and it's so true. That sacrifice, it was so necessary to pay my debt. It unleashes the glory of God's mercy and grace. But by itself, it would be limited just to a a tragic martyrdom of one that was beloved of God. But it's the resurrection that we celebrate today. The victory over death. The victory over the debt of sin that I can never cover on my own. When I was a boy, I liked to read uh, adventure books. And um, I remember, uh, especially in a couple of them, uh, Robin Hood and, uh, 
and Shipwrecked by Robert Louis Stevenson, that at certain parts of the books there would be illustrations because it would give you a visual image of um, the climactic parts of the story. And, and that's the way these scriptures that I've read to you are to me. Um, they're like snapshots out of this unfolding drama those days we call Easter, those days of, of great sorrow, but also great victory. And we begin in those scriptures with Jesus warning his disciples of the approaching crucifixion and promising that he would rise again and defeat death. These men that he was with in those first two scriptures they're the men that Jesus chose to be with him in his ministry. And he wanted them to learn the truth about our Heavenly Father's love. And its power. So that they might be, become prepared to continue the work that he had started of presenting humanity with the choice of our lives. And he, was, he knew he wouldn't be physically with them always, and he told them so. And he's not physically here among us today. That would be nice. It would be nice to have Jesus healing the sick and ministering to the brokenhearted and showing, his, showing us by the example of his love what our Heavenly Father desires for us through his daily example. but like the act of creation. Creation was momentary in time, and yet it's eternal in its significance to mankind. So it is with God's revelation of himself. His revelation of himself through Jesus. It's now a part of our history, but it lives on with eternal power to transform our lives if we just call on his name to repent. So Jesus warned the disciples, and this wasn't the first time that he warned them of what lay ahead. And his words convey that he knew the agony of what lay ahead. These are the words that he used when he warned them. Betrayed, condemned to death, Mocked, scourged, crucified. Jesus knew he would be separated from the Father by the weight of our sin. He knew the completeness of the sacrifice that would be required to resolve our separation from God. In the upper room, he warned them that one of them would be his betrayer. Every one of them asked is it me? Can you hear their honesty in that question? Every one of them said, is it me? I know in my heart I'm not fit to judge Judas. There are those, uh, it is believed that, that Judas was, uh, like many of his day, he was looking for a Messiah to come and to break the yoke, the yoke of, of the Romans' rule over the Jewish people, to come with the power of, of holy wrath and maybe open warfare. And yet here is the one that Judas hoped for, the leader he followed, and he's telling them all that he was wa walking open-eyed, the open shame and the cross. The victory that Jesus promised was not the victory that Judas was hoping for at all. <clears throat> I find that uh, I'm guilty of something like that in my life. I expect my Savior to give me victory over life's troubles and bring me fulfillment and joy. 
will I betray him when he asks me to pick up his cross and follow him? To endure some hardship for his name's sake? Maybe to be reliant on him when I feel pain? Or to show a homeless person that God loves him? You know, sometimes we, uh, we fool ourselves and we trade things of eternal value for things that are very fleeting in nature. And so uh, I wonder sometimes, will a, will a nice place at the lake or a nice promotion or financial security, will that be my 30 pieces of silver? But Jesus knows us. He knows our nature and he knows our weaknesses. He knows how we struggle when we're faced with difficult choices because he experiences these kinds of things himself in a human way, as a human man. There's a verse in Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15, that I love. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was on all points tested like as we are, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And we can hear that truth in the account of his prayer at Gethsemane. I don't know that he felt fear. But I know that he understood that the pain would be the utmost. He told his disciples he would be crucified, and he knew what crucifixion meant. But as I read those words, it seems that I can hear dread in his prayer. And I wonder if that moment in the garden was the greatest agony he ever faced. But what I do know is that He placed the will of the Father above all else. He always obeyed him. He overcame that test of devotion in the garden, and he chose that love for his Father's will to save us, and that opened the gates of mercy for all mankind. Then there's Pilate. Pilate was faced with the question that we all must face. What will you do? Sorry. What will you do with this Jesus? Pilate tried to evade it. He made a big show of washing his hands. But there's no evading this eternal question. To do anything less than to say with full purpose of heart, today, Today is the day of my salvation. To do anything less than that is to say in my heart, uh, today the answer is no. And I run the risk of saying no to God one time or a hundred times too many. I run the risk of no longer being able to let go and surrender and say, yes, Father, please make me yours. Please make me whole. God never takes our agency away from us, but I wonder if it's possible, I believe it's possible to throw it away, to throw that agency away, to become unable to take self and pride off the throne of my heart, the place that belongs to him. In that question, what will I do with Jesus? We have to answer that question every day, multiple times a day, because every day holds all these choices. 
and we can choose the words and the ways that Jesus taught and that testify of him. And we can choose to ignore the Spirit's leading or maybe pick up that sin that's lying right there just to reach away or a thought away or a word away. So who do I serve today? Who do I serve this minute? So back to Pilate. Um, he put the question to the crowd that day. He said, what will ye then that I shall do with him? And those words crucify him ring in our ears, don't they? But there were other words in that response. They also said, away with him. Take him away. We can't abide what he stands for. Jesus told Pilate during his interrogation that he came to bear witness to the truth, God's truth. And Pilate replied kind of rhetorically, saying, well, what is truth? But Pilate wasn't being rhetoric at all, rhetorical at all, because Pilate knew the answer, and the crowd knew the answer, and we know it today. God has written his truth in the heart of every man. Corey read a scripture today that testifies of that, that stood out to me. Moroni 7, 14. For behold, the spirit of Christ is given to every man that they may know good from evil. Wherefore, I show unto you the way to judge. For everything which inviteth to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. In John 17, we find Christ's prayer for his disciples. And in verse 17, we read him praying to his father, saying, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. But the crowd denied God's truth that day, and they cried out to have that truth taken away from them. So we might conclude from that that the crowd sealed his fate that day. Back in February, on Communion Sunday, my brother Gary Crosley brought some words that went something like this. Men put our Savior on the cross, but it was love that held him there. That's God's truth and his love in action. There are several places in the scripture where it tells us that God created all things through the power of his only begotten. This is the power of our Savior. Those nails could not have held him there. But he decided that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. And it was God's will to give the ultimate sacrifice, his son, to be our atonement. It was God's love who held him there. Before he died, Jesus asked God to forgive those who crucified him. Our sin was there too, you know, yours and mine, needing that atonement. Jesus had taught his disciples that in order to be forgiven, they must forgive. And even in his dying breaths, Jesus lived out his teaching and the example of his words. Sometimes when we're faced with that question, what will I do with Jesus? We choose badly because of the burden of sin that we carry being so great. I want to tell you this morning, that's a lie that the adversary wants to sell you. How can God love me? How can he want me after all I've done? And the next time you hear that lie in your mind, I want you to remember those words. Father, forgive them. 
because he desires to say forgive them again today. If only we will desire to say, Father, forgive me. Love held him to the cross, but death could not hold him in the tomb. Love burst the bands of death, and life took the place where death had been. What will you do with Jesus? How about we roll away the stone from our heart's door and let his life fill us up? What will you do with Jesus? I don't want to end our worship today leaving that question hanging. I know the answer that many of you have made to that question because I've had the blessing of being able to spend some time with you and see how you live it in your lives, in the words that you say, the things you do, and the look in your eyes. But there may be someone today within the sound of my voice who's searching. Maybe the Holy Spirit is leading you today. Maybe your heart is hurting. Maybe maybe the circumstances of life are calling to you today to find out more about the kind of love that held Jesus to the cross, that conquered sin and death, that defeated the grave. And so I want to point out to you that we are literally surrounded by people who care about that and who would love nothing more than help you or me take those first steps towards our Heavenly Father, the God who wants so much for you to have abundant life in Him. You can talk with our pastor, Jason Anderson. You can talk with his dad up here, Eldon, or our presiding elder today, Rich Rowland. Ask this repentance sinner. But don't leave that question hang even longer. What will you do with Jesus? Hear the words he spoke here in the Americas after the resurrection we celebrate today. In 3 Nephi 4.52. Behold, for such have I laid down my life and have taken it up again. Therefore, repent and come unto me ye ends of the earth, and be saved. Would you please stand and pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, We're so grateful for this day that you've given us. And as you allowed us the opportunity to choose to be here, be a part of this service, whether in person or from home, we're grateful for that. And Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity of forgiveness that you put before us. Father, we know that you walked this earth before you showed examples of love and service and sacrifice. And it is, be- it is because of that service, Father, that we have a special joy in our heart today because we know you made the choice and you have victory over the cross and you atoned for our sin. Help us to choose to serve you now and to show that love and to so- sacrifice where we can. Father, guide us and direct us and help us to have you in our heart. This is my prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen.